Hi everyone, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm founder and CEO of the 311 Institute and the World Futures Forum. I'm better known as a futurist, and I look at the next 50 years of technology. So what I'm gonna be doing today is I'm gonna be walking through what life could be like in 2069. That's it, when most of you will be around 50 years older. Now, when we have a look at this date, it shouldn't be lost on us that in 1969, Samsung brought to market the world's first televisor. And for all of you wondering basically what a televisor is, it's a TV. Now, this is the TV that we were watching in 1969, and it really shouldn't be lost on you that while the TV's changed, frankly, a lot of the content that we're still watching still looks exactly like this. But fast forward to 2069, and the content is vastly different because all of a sudden we are living in this thing called the metaverse. Not metaverse one, which is where we're kind of trying to get to today with Fortnite, Second Life, and all these other kinds of platforms, but metaverse two, where immersive reality is so real, you can't tell what's real and what's not real because you are literally, to use a Hollywood analogy, plugged into the matrix. Now, other things, when we have a look at 2069 that sort of might surprise a lot of people. When we have a look at the building blocks of technology in 2069, increasingly computers are going to be chemical, liquid, molecular and quantum. So today we can already see quantum computers coming through that are 100 million times faster than anything that we have on the planet. Now, in addition to that, we already see chemical computers coming through. We've already created liquid computer chips and liquid storage, just to put this into perspective. And when we have a look at molecular computing, the US military wants to be able to put a molecular information system, something along the size of a current Google hyperscale data center into something the size of your office table. Now, imagine that from a power perspective, exabyte computing, literally at your fingertips. However, things get even weirder because when we actually have a look at the future of artificial intelligence today, we talk about machine learning, we talk about deep learning, and we typically talk in terms of bits and bytes, ones and zeros. However, again, today we've already 3D printed artificial intelligence. We have already created artificial intelligences out of DNA. And bringing us onto the topic of DNA and biology, we've also created the world's sixth generation biological computer. We can turn human cells basically into dual core computing devices. We can turn you into a living pharmacy where these computers inside our bodies can detect the biomarkers in your bloodstream, figure out that you're getting ill and then manufacture the pharmaceutical drugs that you need to treat that right in situ. Imagine never having to go to the doctors ever again. Now, in addition to that, when we have a look at quantum communications, yeah, today we're on the verge of 5G, we're coming up to 6G, so 6G is terabit communications. By 2040, we start seeing 7G. But really, now that we have quantum technologies coming through in the 2040 timeframe, this is really when we start transitioning to 1Q, 2Q and 3Q, where Q is quantum. So all of a sudden, basically, we have unhackable quantum communications, basically, at a planetary scale. Now, from an energy perspective, lots and lots of stuff's changing here as well. So, for example, batteryless. You know, how would you like your phone to not have to be powered by a battery? Now, again, that might sound a little bit like science fiction, but two years ago, we actually managed to create a smartphone that doesn't have a battery because it harvests all of the energy that it needs from radiation and radio frequencies in the air. So when we have a look at our future, our future can literally be batteryless. Wouldn't that be amazing? In addition to that, it's also wireless. You know, so when we have a look at, for example, lithium ion cars and electric vehicles that we have today, they can be wirelessly charged, both at a local level, but also at a regional level as well. So in the future, energy is both batteryless and wireless. But that's not everything. So how about being able to use TANGs? So a TANG basically is a triboelectric nano generator. Now, this is of particular interest to people who have implanted medical devices like pacemakers and everything else, because TANGs, which actually again exist today, can harvest energy from your bloodstream. So imagine never ever having to replace the battery in your pacemaker because you literally are the battery. In addition to that, when we have a look at photovoltaics, today, by see photovoltaics, we have over a trillion watts of renewable energy installed. And if you went and bought a solar panel, it would be about 17 to 20% energy efficient. But in the labs, we have 30%, 48%, 
80% and we have 132% energy efficient solar panels already here. The 132% energy efficient solar panel is courtesy of a nanophotonic material that can capture moonlight, ambient light and all kinds of other light but to generate electricity using a material called black silicon. And when we have a look at that, you have energy that you can generate for almost zero cost. In addition to that structural, you know, if you really love your electric vehicles, then you might just love the Terzo Millennio, which is a Lamborghini coming in 2030, because we can turn, the ba we can turn your car or the shell of the product into what we call a structural battery. So this is where we can use carbon fiber, we mix it with carbon nanotubes and other kinds of different technologies. So the product is literally the battery. Now, again, when we step it up, literally and both figuratively, let's step it up into space. So NASA at the moment are using 3D and 4D printing to begin printing structures in low Earth orbit. So they're starting off with satellites, they'll progress to spacecraft, they'll then progress to space stations. Now 4D printing is quite interesting because you can actually create a, a self-assembling space station that you printed in space. But sticking on the energy theme, we can 3D print and circa 2025, we're going to see the first solar power plants put into low Earth orbit, courtesy of the US and China with a long-term goal of being able to beam six gigawatts of electricity from low Earth orbit to base stations on the ground using microwave transmission and or laser transmission. So imagine better when Texas's energy grid goes offline, you just repurpose a satellite, instant energy to a disaster zone or whatever it happens to be. Now, cellular meats, you know, when we have a look at food, the food that we eat is changing beyond all recognition. So on the one hand, we can grow food in vertical farms. Um, and vertical farms use 99% less water, they use 100% less chemicals, they can create crops basically with eight times the yield. But when we have a look at cellular meats, I can take a cell from a chicken. And in this particular case, this Ian's name was Ian. I can put that into a bioreactor and I can grow chicken nuggets. I can grow fillet steak, I can grow duck, beef, I can grow all kinds of different things. And it's not plant-based meat, it's actual meat. Now, China has placed over $300 million worth of orders basically with Israel basically for this kind of technology. So this is literally where we can feed the planet protein from animals without the animal. Because we are replicating what goes on inside of an animal in a bioreactor, we can do the same with fish. We can do the same with salmon, tuna, courtesy of companies like Finless Foods. So when we think about the world's food, food shortages in the future, we already have the technology to solve the United Nations biggest challenge, how we feed 11 billion people in 2050. But it's 2069, so this is kind of my everyday. And if I can grow a chicken nugget, basically from the cell of a chicken, what stops me from taking a cell from a peacock, a zebra, or a panda, and literally having zebra burgers. So our relationship with food in 2069 is very, very different to what we see today. And from a fruit perspective, you know, we can engineer fruit so I can 4D print fruits. When I can 4D print fruits, I can print any kind of fruit with any kind of flavor in any kind of form including rather exotic and strange forms. I could literally, courtesy of genetic engineering, create a watermelon that tastes like an orange or an orange that tastes like fillet steak. That's it, so let's just sort of mind, bend your mind a little bit there. In addition to that, basically, I can actually already create fruits with vaccines in. So we saw the FDA actually approve a couple recently. So your fruit could quite literally make you healthier. Now, by 2069, everyone's getting a little bit old. 60 is now just the teenage years because increasingly we are living to 150. Now, the reason why I say this is because in the year 2028, according to all the biopharmaceutical bio companies, we reach something called escape velocity. Now, escape velocity is the point in time where new medical advances, and I'll show you some, 
add an extra year to our life or more than an extra year to our life for every year that we've lived. So when we have a look at some of these different technologies, you are literally replaceable. You know, your mother was wrong. You know, when your mother basically said you were, you were not replaceable, she was wrong. But in this case, it's actually a good thing. You are completely replaceable because we can 3D print human organs. So we can 3D print skin, bone, tissue, cartilage. Basically, we can 3D print kidneys, liver. In Israel, basically back in, back in the day, back in 2020, we had Israeli researchers who 3D printed a miniature human heart, a beating human heart. Now, on the one hand, that might be a little bit freaky, but when you start fast forwarding to 2030, these human hearts are actually human size. In which case, from an organ transplant perspective, if you have a heart attack, we can literally grow you a new heart and there's no fear of rejection because it's your heart. In addition to that, because we can 3D print electronics basically into human organs, I could ask you if you want a hybrid heart. And a hybrid heart, for example, might contain electronics or thin film batteries. And when it detects that there's a certain amount of arrhythmia going on, it just kickstarts itself again. And then when we have a look at human too, so really by 2045, we're gonna be hitting something called the singularity, basically where humans merge with technology, bearing in mind that technology used to be the mainframe in a data center. Then it was the laptop and the computer basically on our desk. Now it's the smartphone in our hand. Now it's the implanted medical devices in our bodies and everything else. It's the wearables on our skin. Increasingly, we sort of see this merging basically in 2045 called the singularity. However, courtesy of technologies like CRISPR, which is an incredibly powerful gene editing technology, I can create designer humans. So we've already created designer humans, both in the UK, in Mexico, and illegally in China. And the twins who were born in China basically were born with a genetic construct that means that they cannot get ill. So they are generally resistant to almost every pathogen on Earth because when you get infected by a virus, the virus gets into a biological cell, it has to go all the way through its DNA strand, it gets to a telomere, which is like the end of the story. When you hit the end of the virus's story, the cell replicates. Now, by genetically engineering humans, and we've already done this with E. coli bacteria, we can make people disease resistant in ways that we never imagined before. And that's before I turn you into a biological computer. Now, from a meta-human perspective, increasingly, I can start using technologies basically that we see in America. I can turn you into living sensors. So I can get it so that your cell, your cells are literally cellular receivers. So today we use smartphones basically to detect 5G signals, for example, and everything else. I can do that same technology with your cells. So you are actually a receiver and transmitter. Now, when I start turning you into a receiver and a transmitter, because I know what you're asking, you're saying, well, what about the future of the TV? Well, the TV basically can be all manner of different things. That's it, but personally, in 2069, I love the classics. I still have this hanging on my wall. But in terms of how I stream content to it, I don't use Netflix. See, I don't use Amazon Prime. I don't use any of those to stream content to my historic TV. I just use my brain. And this is a little bit of archive footage back from 2019. This is where we used a brain machine interface to read someone's brain waves that were then interpreted by an artificial intelligence. And the artificial intelligence then recompiled their brain waves into images. And I know what you're thinking, basically back in 2019, basically these were really low resolution and everything else, but technology is a rocket ship. Everything gets faster at exponential rates. By 2025, I see this was high definition. By 2030, we're adding sound. That's it. And now if I want to watch entertainment on my museum piece, I just think what I want to watch and it just plays it. But then again, I'm in the metaverse. So is this all real anyway? Thank you very much.